We've seen black box controllers that don't make any assumptions. They don't require any knowledge of the underlying process to be controlled. However, in practice, often we have such knowledge available. Remember the last lecture, lecture number five on vehicle dynamics, where we have built relatively precise um, kinematic and dynamic bicycle models for modeling the behavior of cars. So of course we should use that knowledge in order to build better controllers. And in this unit, we're going to talk about geometry controllers that are one type of controllers that make use of that knowledge. Let's first talk about pure pursuit controllers. The goal of a pure pursuit controller, which is the name for one specific type of controller of vehicle controller. So now we're specific to vehicles. The goal of a pure pursuit controller is to track a target point here in red at a certain look ahead distance D. This is this dashed line here in order to follow a path in red. In this case, in the case of a pure pursuit controller, the look ahead distance is defined as the distance between the target point and the center of the rear axle, the center between the two rear wheels. So given the current state of the vehicle, given knowledge of the location of the center of the rear wheels, um, and given the look ahead distance, <clears throat> we can calculate the target point on the path that we want to follow. So we want to track the target point. We want to steer the vehicle. We want to adjust the steering angle of that vehicle delta such that the vehicle comes closer to that target point. In other words, we want to exploit the geometric relationships here between the vehicle and the path to follow in order to minimize the cross track error, which is the error between <clears throat> the target point and the vehicle. So this is the lateral error, in this case defined by this line here. So how can we do this? We want to minimize the cross track error E. And we want to do so by following a circular trajectory. Remember again, from the kinematic bicycle model that the rigid body, the vehicle follows a circular trajectory around an instantaneous center of rotation, this black dot here. So we want to define a circular trajectory such that when we follow that circular trajectory, the rear wheel will coincide or come closer to the target point. And of course, over time, once we simulate this model, the target point will move as the vehicle will move, but eventually we'll get closer and closer. We want to steer such that we get closer and closer to that path. <clears throat> so we can see the circular trajectory here in gray. That is the circle that's formed around the rotation center in black. And so we have this line here connecting the target point and the rotation center. And the length of that line is are the radius of that gray circle and the length of the line connecting the rear wheel with the rotation center is also r because both the rear wheel and the target point lie on that circle that we have formed such that it passes through the rear wheel and the target point now the question is how can we set the steering angle the steering angle is determined by the angle alpha. So we want to derive a relationship that relates alpha to delta. What is alpha? Alpha is the angle between the vehicle heading direction, this line here, and the look ahead direction, the dashed, dashed line here. And we can calculate alpha. This is our input. This is our measurement because we have defined that target point at a certain look ahead distance along that path. So we can measure alpha. And the question now is how should we adjust delta such that the vehicle moves along that circular trajectory? 
if we know alpha. In other words, what is the function delta of alpha look like? Right? Um, one thing to note here is that this angle delta does not only appear here as the steering angle, but similar to the kinematic bicycle model that we are drawing here, this angle also appears here because we have a right hand uh, orthogonal angle here. And also this angle alpha here leads to, and, and this orthogonal angle here leads to the fact that this angle here is pi half minus alpha because this is orthogonal, so it's pi half. And so this must be pi half minus alpha if this is alpha. <clears throat> now, because this line and this line have a length of r, so they have the same length, and because the inner angles of this triangle must sum up to 180 degrees or pi, and because we have pi half minus alpha here, and so do we have pi half minus alpha here, because these two are, have the same length, we know that this angle here must be 2 alpha. So we can also define this angle between these, these two lines, the line connecting the rotation center and the target point, and the line connecting the rotation center and the rear wheel. Okay. And then, of course, we have L, which is the um, distance between the rear and the front wheel, the base of the vehicle. Now, I think we have to find all the quantities on this slide. Yes. Good. So we can continue. Okay, remember, we want to define a relationship that relates alpha to delta. Given any alpha, we want to know what delta is. So let's derive that relationship now. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to apply the law of science. The law of science tells us that this distance d, the look ahead distance d, divided by sine of 2 alpha must be equal to this distance r divided by the sine of pi half minus alpha. This is the law of science. Now, through similar trigonometric considerations, we also know that sine of 2 alpha is equal to 2 sine alpha cosine alpha. And sine of pi half minus alpha is similar cosine of alpha. This is uh, simply cosine of alpha. So we get d over ta 2 times sine alpha cosine alpha equals to r over cosine alpha. And so now we can um, remove uh, cosine alpha from this equation. And we can uh, write 1 over r, which is actually the curvature of this circle, of this uh, trajectory here, of this gray trajectory here. So this is the curvature kappa. 1 over r equals 2 sine alpha divided by d. So we simply have this expression 2 sine alpha divided by d if we divide 1 over r. This is the curvature of this gray trajectory. This is the first quantity that we had to derive here. Now, the steering angle is calculated as tangent of, alpha, uh, of delta equals L over r, similar to the expression that we have already seen in the lecture on the kinematic bicycle model. Tangent of delta is equal to L over r. And because we have just defined what 1 over r is, we can plug in 2 sine alpha over d here. So we get tangent of delta is 2 L sine alpha over d. Or in other words, delta, the steering angle, is the arcus tangent of 2 L sine alpha over d. Now, if we assume that the <clears throat> uh, steering angle is small, then the tangent is approximately linear. So we can say, well, the steering angle delta is approximately 2L sine alpha divided by d. 
d here is the look ahead distance and that is a parameter of our system and it's important to note that this look ahead distance should be based on the vehicle speed if the vehicle speed is high we want to have a larger look ahead distance because we don't want to make very abrupt steering maneuvers so in practice d is often chosen as a constant k this is a parameter times the velocity of the vehicle now in terms of the cross check error what do we obtain we want to now see how so here we have derived basically this relationship that we were interested in before delta of alpha so we know how to compute now delta from alpha with this approximation or without but what we wanted to do actually is we want to minimize the cross check error so how does this relate to the cross check error in terms of the cross check error we obtain the following expression so we're looking at this triangle now here the blue one sine of alpha equals e over d um, and from the previous slide we know that the steering angle is defined through this expression here <clears throat> because the steering angle is defined through this expression here <clears throat> and because e equals sine alpha over uh, because sine alpha equals e over d we can plug that into here and so we get the steering angle to become equal to the arcus tangent of 2 l e over d square or if we make that low angle approximation we obtain the steering angle as 2 l over d squared times the cross track arrow e what does that mean well, it means that the pure pursuit controller acts as a proportional controller with respect to the cross check error because we have delta equals a proportionality constant times the cross check error e. So indeed, we derived a proportional controller for the cross check error um, where the proportionality constant depends on l and d, and d is often based on the vehicle speed, as mentioned before. Now, a slight modification of the idea of pure pursuit control is called Stanley control. And it was successfully used by the Stanford racing team to win the DARPA Grand Challenge. The control law used by Stanley combines an expression that is very similar to the one that we've seen before. It's the arcus tangent of a constant of proportionality or a parameter times the cross check error over the velocity. But it also includes another term that's directly trying to minimize the heading error. And in contrast to the pure pursuit controller, it has the reference not at the rear axle, but at the front axle. So it measures cross check error with respect to the front axle. And in contrast to the pure pursuit controller, it doesn't have any look ahead. It just tries to find the closest point on the path for a, a, the uh, front wheel or with respect to the front wheel. And that's the target point it use for computing the control law for the steering angle. So it's a controller that uses the front axle, has no look ahead and combines heading and cross check error all into one steering law. And it has some very nice properties that can be theoretically shown. For example, it can be shown that the cross check error converges exponentially to zero independently of the actual velocity v. And uh, this uh, one thing that has to be mentioned here, of course, is that this controller also just works for comparably small velocities without disturbances because it doesn't model tire forces, for example. So it's still a relatively simple control law, but it can be extended. There's various extensions of this control law. And for low speeds, it's a very good control law. Let's have a look at how this works concretely. Let's have a look at a case study. So here we want to follow that red path shown on the top. And the target point is again the closest point to the front wheel of the path. 
So let's assume the vehicle is in that state. And obviously we need to steer to the left to reach the path. Now, because we have a, a large cross track error, the, this term here will become large. So what that means is the steering wheel will turn left. The front wheel will turn left. And that's independent of the fact that actually the vehicle orientation is almost parallel to the path. So this term here might be zero, but this term here is large because we are far from the path. The, the steering angle becomes large. Now, once we steer into this direction, we might at some point reach this position here, facing directly towards the path or almost directly towards the path. Now, in this case, as the heading changes, the heading correction, precisely this term here, counteracts the cross check error correction. So we still have a cross check error, which means the cross check error tells our vehicle we should steer left. But at the same time, now we have a strong steering angle, a strong heading error indicated by this blue angle psi here. And so this heading correction tells our model, no, no, we shouldn't oversteer, we should steer back. And so in this particular case, both of them balance out and the vehicle steers straight forward to move towards the target point. Now, as the vehicle moves closer to the target point, the cross track error decreases and the importance of the heading correction outweighs the importance of the cross track error. So the vehicle starts steering towards the right as it comes closer to the path and that's illustrated here. And so it will eventually come closer and closer to the path and reach the path smoothly. In summary, the Stanley controller can correct large cross track and large heading errors. And two concrete examples are illustrated here on this slide from Steven Waslander, where in the first example, we have a, a large cross track error, but the heading of the vehicle is actually correct. But because we have a large cross track error, the vehicle steers to the right until it smoothly reaches the desired path in blue. On the right, we see an example where the cross tag error is actually zero initially, but we have a very large heading error. And because of this large heading error, the vehicle starts moving into along this trajectory here until it also reaches the desired target path. A nice thing, a nice property about the Stanley controller that can be proven is global stability. Independent of the initial conditions, we are assured that this control law guides the vehicle back to the target path. However, the model doesn't consider noisy observations or actuator dynamics or tire force effects. And there's various extensions of this model that improve it. For example, what people typically do is they include softening or dampening terms to improve uh, stability and uh, also add curvature information um, to improve the Stanley control law. <clears throat> so finally, I want to show you a little clip of the Stanley vehicle navigating during the DARPA Grand Challenge. In this case, along a steep and small path uh, through the mountains where the vehicle behind the Stanley vehicle is just the vehicle um, that's controlling and making sure everything is going all right. But the car itself is driven autonomously. And as you can see, it drives pretty slowly um, and it's using the Stanley controller to move along this path.